The history of math is our intellectual foundation to understanding science. Science, beautiful, awesome, wonderful science. It's the creative foundation to our ineffable future. Hi, I'm Gabrielle Burchak, and this is my podcast, Math, Science, History. I often promote my website, mathsciencehistory.com, which I built myself. Of all the hosts that I've been with, my experience with Bluehost has been the best. What I really like about Bluehost is their customer service. It is top notch and they are always there to help me. So if you're looking to build a website or you're looking to move to a new host, I highly recommend Bluehost. You can access Bluehost through my affiliate link, which is www.bluehost.com com slash track t-r-a-c-k slash math science history all one word bluehost is fantastic and they are affordable it's only $3.95 a month if you sign up for 36 months so if you do the math it's $142 to start and for me it was the smartest business investment I've ever made a great man once said It is best I had no learning, for many learned men be great fools. This great man was Thomas Fuller. He was born in 1710 in Africa, and he was known as the Virginia Calculator and Negro Tom. Thomas Fuller arrived in the United States in 1724 when he was just 14 years old. Against his will, he was put on a boat and sent to America. He became an American slave. And though he never really learned how to read or write, Fuller could multiply to nine-digit numbers, he could state the number of seconds in a given time, and he could calculate the number of grains of corn in a given mass. He had a mathematical brain and an incredible ability to carry out mental math. Fuller had been a slave for Presley and Elizabeth Cox, an illiterate, childless couple who had a 232-acre farm in Alexandria, Virginia. Fuller worked as a field hand for most of his life for the Coxes, and ever since he was young, he began counting and adding and multiplying. There are stories that he taught himself mathematics, which began first by counting to 10, and then to 100, and then ultimately he counted the hairs on a cow's tail, which came out to 2,000. 1,872, as recounted by him in an interview. Fuller also counted bushels of wheat and also developed his own techniques for measuring distances and for multiplying these numbers in order to determine long distances. He also determined the diameter of the Earth's orbit. So this guy was really brilliant. And because Elizabeth Cox was not that smart, she utilized him on all areas of the farm for landscaping, home repairs, and calculating the crops and animals on the farm. So it worked to her advantage to keep him around. Because of his exceptional mathematical capabilities, many people wanted to buy Fuller from his owners, but they did refuse to sell him. And even when Elizabeth's husband, Presley, passed away in 1782, she still refused to sell him. In 1788, Philadelphians William Hartshorn and Samuel Coates, who were members of the Pennsylvania Society for the Abolition of Slavery, went to Virginia because they wanted to meet Fuller. At first, they were really suspicious of his genius, and so they decided to quiz him. Now, keep in mind, at this point, when they were visiting him, Fuller was 78 years old, so his memory was already failing, but he was really on top of his mathematical game. So when they met him, they asked him, how many seconds are in a year and a half? And he answered the question in about two minutes. He said there were 47,304,000 in a year and a half. Then they asked him how many seconds a man has lived who is 70 years old, 15 days, and 12 hours old. Fuller answered this in less than two minutes, stating that there were 2,210,500,800 seconds. When one of the men actually corrected him, Fuller replied and said, well, you forgot the leap years. So again, this man was really smart. Coates commented that it was a shame that he hadn't had an education equal to his genius. 
And this is where that first quote comes in, where Fuller said that many learned men be great fools. And for me, this quote is so powerful, especially today as we struggle and still struggle with so much unnecessary racism. We've been dealing with slavery for 400 years when the first boat arrived in Virginia in 1619. Yes, in 1619. That's when it began. And it took over 200 years to ratify the 13th Amendment. And then even then, segregation continued, discrimination continued, and hate continued. But what Fuller's intellect did do was something extraordinary for this country. Fuller was used as evidence that Africans are as smart as white people. And he probably knew what was going on. He was brilliant and insightful, and he probably recognized that he was being used as evidence. But nevertheless, he was a kind and humble man. So he probably surmised that he was being used to advocate for the abolishment of racism. So Fuller received many visitors in his later years, many of whom were philosophers, academics, and doctors. And all of these visitors would arrive, ask him questions to which he would answer. They would write down their findings and then go back to the northern states to make their case for the abolishment of slavery. One of these visitors was Benjamin Rush, and Rush was considered to be the father of American psychiatry. He was a physician and a chemist, and he was also a signatory to the Declaration of Independence. But most importantly, he was the secretary to the Pennsylvania Society for the Abolition of Slavery. So, Benjamin Rush wanted to see slavery abolished, and he felt as though Fuller was the perfect individual to make his case. Unfortunately, Rush was up against some very influential individuals who had the means and the funds to keep slavery legal. One such individual was philosopher John Locke. Though he was an Enlightenment thinker, he also owned stock in slave trading companies. He had monetary interest in maintaining the status quo. So, though he proclaimed his philosophy for natural rights and human freedom, he had had no qualms writing absurdities such as, quote, every free man of Carolina shall have absolute power and authority over his Negro slaves, unquote. Then there were other philosophers of his time like David Hume and Immanuel Kant who had tremendous power over public opinion with their published works. Hume wrote in 1741, quote, I am apt to suspect the Negroes to be naturally inferior to the whites, unquote. What we have here are very influential men coming from white privilege and perpetuating this absurd belief that people with different skin color have a different intellect. So Rush was up against this prominent mindset, and he decided to present Fuller as the perfect person to help his cause to end slavery. Rush needed to prove to a community of slave owners and philosophers who supported slavery that Fuller's intellect was proof that slaves were as smart and as valuable as the people who owned them. Rush decided to publicize Fuller's capabilities by writing papers and stories that he would publish in monthly journals. Through Rush's work, the news of Fuller spread across the northern states. William Dixon, in his fervent work, Letters on Slavery, reproduced Rush's work as well. As news about Fuller began to spread into the southern states, writers would start to use terms and language slave owners in the South would understand. The abolitionists figured out that if they used the language of their target audience, they could use it to their advantage to make a case for Fuller, a case for slaves, and a case to end slavery. Then Fuller's story spread overseas. International politicians and philosophers also wrote about Fuller and his intellect, and they used it as a case for pushing the end of slavery in other parts of the world. So, basically, in his later years, Fuller had become an international genius. But the end of slavery shouldn't have required the exhibition of a kind, humble, and intelligent man who was stolen from his land. Historians speculate that Fuller came from a part of Africa where math was an extensive part of his education. Writings show that many of the slave traders and the slaves that were taken from Africa in the early 18th century and 17th century came from an area which spoke highly of the Persian astronomer and mathematician Muhammad ibn Muhammad, whom I've mentioned before. So, in parts of Africa, mathematics was prominent, which is not surprising considering that mathematics and 
Islam in the 9th and 10th centuries were established by Greek mathematicians. And a lot of the Greek mathematics wouldn't be with us today if it wasn't for many of the Islam translators during that time. I'm going to conclude this with an elegy. When Fuller passed away in 1790, he was mourned all around the world, and rightly so. And the elegy reads, Negro Tom, the famous African calculator, age 80 years old. He was the property of Mrs. Elizabeth Cox of Alexandria. Tom was a very black man. He was brought to this country at the age of 14 and was sold as a slave with many of his unfortunate countrymen. This man was a prodigy. Though he could neither read nor write, he had perfectly acquired the art of enumeration. The power of recollection and the strength of memory were so complete in him that he could multiply seven into itself that product by seven and the product so produced by seven for seven times. He could give the number of months, days, weeks, hours, minutes, and seconds in any period of time that any person chose to mention, allowing in his calculation for all the leap years that happened in the time, and would give the number of poles, yards, feet, inches, and barley corns in any given direction, say the diameter of the Earth's orbit, and in every calculation he would produce the true answer in less time than 99 men in a hundred would produce with their pens. And what was perhaps more extraordinary, though interrupted in the progress of his calculation and engaged in discourse upon any other subject, his operations were not thereby in the least deranged, so as to make it necessary for him to begin again but he would go on from where he had left off, and he could give any or all of the stages through which the calculation had passed. His first essay in numbers was counting the hairs and the tails of the cows and the horses, which he was set to keep. With little instruction, he would have been able to cast upon plats of land. He took great notice of the lines of land which he had surveyed. He drew just conclusions from facts, surprisingly so for his opportunities. Thus died Negro Tom this self-taught arithmetician, this untutored scholar. Had his opportunity of improvement been equal to those of thousands of his fellow men, neither the Royal Society of London, the Academy of Sciences at Paris, or even Newton himself need have been ashamed to acknowledge him a brother in science. I'm Gabrielle Burchak. This podcast has been brought to you by Caffeine. Delicious, wonderful, nectar of the gods caffeine. Coffee, tea, coffee candy, you name it. I love it. Thank you for listening to Math Science History. If you like what you are listening to, please remember to subscribe and leave a review. I would really appreciate that. If you are interested in reading more about the history of math and science, please come visit me at mathsciencehistory.com. And while you are there, if you like what you're listening to, please feel free to click on that coffee button and buy me a cup of coffee. Until next week, carpe diem!